Well, hello everybody, nice to be here. I've done the math and a week from now I will still be single. If the time difference worked the other way, I'd be married, but it doesn't. So anyway, um, I want to start by talking a little bit about um, the personal and go back and forth between the broader issues. There is a connection I'm going to try to draw together. Um, but what I've experienced with my fiance and I know what other people have experienced when they've been in good relationships is every day is better than my best days before. And this, it's an old word, it's overused, but the synergy we're able to produce is just amazing and support each other and lead each other to greater things. And I, I think it's a model for, and I know many other people have it here and bless you for that. I think it's really a model for um, what couples can do together, what people can do together and support each other. And so I, I'm very grateful for that. And I think it's something we often get focused on the problems and understandably so. And yet it's also worth keeping our eyes on the prizes as to the, the great things that can be in store. So um, I wanted to say that to start. And also it doesn't have to be in relationship. It can be in many other ways. Men and women can do great work together. So, um, I, you know, it, this, this issue is strange. I, I thought it was strange when I first heard about it. Why are people worrying about this? I mean, there's so many other issues in the world. And I, I eventually decided that there was enough to it that I wanted to get involved. But I started as a men's rights activist. I've never really liked that term. I prefer gender equity activist. I always have, and then I felt like a genius after um, Eric Anderson and our our friend from from Scotland spoke. Um, I, I just something about that terminology feels feels better to me. Although we are in fact men's rights activists, that's what we're doing because of the world we're in. That obviously is tilted in the other direction. So I started as that, and I then heard about this issue. So I, I came in with that background already, and, and I feel like it's, I've had a slightly different path. I'm, it's interesting because the, the gender equity issue is, has as part of it the, what I'm gonna call genital autonomy or anti-male circumcision issue. And yet, they're pretty separate. I mean, there aren't that many activists that work on both. I'm very grateful to, Mike for first of all putting on a great conference and second of all doing all the work that you folks have been doing under his leadership. At the same time they do get separated and there's a number of reasons for that. But both share a number of commonalities that I want to explore a little bit and one is how do we relate to the reigning paradigm? How do we position ourselves? We've got this issue that most people frankly see as a little bit surprising, a little bit strange perhaps. I mean a lot less so than it used to be but that's still true. And um, do we challenge the reigning paradigm? Do we accept it? Do we position ourselves strategically around it? And I, I think the way we're going is the latter. What I'm seeing is we're not so much coming in and trying to refute feminism or trying to refute defenders of genital cutting. I think the more effective strategy is to come in and speak our bit and just let the truth of our position prove itself correct. And they're gonna fade away into the woodwork. I mean young men and women in their 20s are already rolling their eyes when mom or dad talk about old school feminism. I mean, that, that's old news at this point. It's going to go the way of Betamax machines. It's, it's going to happen. So three words describing both issues, I think, are exceptional, muddle, and discomfort. The issues are exceptional because they exist in between the lines, as it were, and exceptional in that most people, I, th I think it's still true today, I might be wrong about this, but I think it's still true today that the majority of people, more than 50% of people in the UK and in the US, don't really think about men's rights that much, don't really think about stopping male circumcision that much or, or problematize it. Basically, it's the status quo, so we're coming in to make exceptions to that. And the issues are a bit of a muddle. I mean, we've seen that in this conference in the sense that we sometimes talk across purposes with, with the circumcision issue, the anti-circumcision issue. There's religious issues. There's psychological issues. There's, um, there's the political issues with doctors. Some people in the movement are very anti-doctors. Some people are very anti-religion. I'm not either. And um, it can sometimes end up working out that we're sort of firing at ourselves without meaning to. We're, we're two parties on opposite sides of a battle line shooting at each other, and that's a very unfortunate situation that I think we need to work our best to avoid in the future. And uh, discomfort, because 
I don't know, I, I've been doing this work, I've been a uh, men's rights activist, depending on how you count, between 22 and uh, 30 years, and a uh, genital autonomy activist for 21 years plus, and it's still uncomfortable. I, I still don't like to talk about it at cocktail parties. I will do it sometimes, the majority of the time I won't. People know what I'm doing, I'll certainly answer questions, but I don't like being a salesman, and maybe, maybe that's just me. Um, so let's see, resource overload is another issue, and I think it's worth keeping in mind. I think probably most people are doing that, but yeah. um, resource overload, we're busy people these days, now more than ever, and this myth that I still remember when email came in, that it was electronic mail, as it was called, that it was going to save us time. Well, <laughs> we see how that worked out. So we're all busy, and not only that, but we all have culturally induced ADD because of the fact that we've just got these images streaming at us constantly. And, and I personally, by choice, am not on Facebook. My organization is Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, but I'm not myself on Facebook. Many people are, and I know there's benefits to it. And, and still, we've got all these images flowing at us and ideas. And at the same time, a lot of us aren't reading the daily newspaper and getting a cross-section. I mean, even the newspapers didn't have a full cross-section, but... We're not getting as much of a cross-section of ideas, and maybe people in this room are, but a lot of people in society aren't. They're more getting filtered news that fits their own biases, their own preconceived notions, and, and that needs to be remembered when we're talking to people because it affects how, the, how they respond to what we're saying. I'm going to read what Dr. Warren Farrell wrote, um, maybe the most powerful, succinct summary of the association of the two issues. Um, general autonomy or anti-circumcision and gender equity. He wrote, quote, America's reflexive continuation of circumcision without research reflects the continuation of our tradition to desensitize boys to feelings of pain, to prepare them not to question the disposability of their bodies any more than they question the disposability of their foreskins. I think he really hit it in a nutshell. So why this genital autonomy terminology? How many people in the world, in the world, in the room have heard the genital autonomy terminology? Raise your hands. Okay, so minority. So I didn't like it at first either. I, I thought it was sort of strange. It, it didn't seem self-explanatory. The point is to not so much be against circumcision, but to be for something and to be for kids' rights to make their own decisions when they reach adulthood about their bodies, which should make sense. Um, so that, that's the reason for the terminology. So why do people care about male genital autonomy? I think most people in this room know the foreskin has three important functions, immunological, protective, and erogenous. I, I won't go into those. You can look them up. I will say, though, there's been lots of progress lately, and that's worth keeping in mind and celebrating. Um, one thing very fresh that I'm very excited about is I led a group that went to the United Nations in 2001 and presented a document that's still in the UN record. Um, and then, as I hoped would happen, other people took up the baton. In 2012, the UK Secular Medical Forum uh, and other cooperating organizations met and worked very closely with the UN. And we've had a team that's been meeting about once every other week for the last two years at really crazy hours because we've got Australians. Americans, Canadians, and people in the UK and, and Israel, and so we can never find a time that works for everybody. And we have just a few days ago, I haven't been able to announce it yet, but just a few days ago we submitted a report on the complications to, uh, and specifically relating to Canada, to the United Nations, so that's very exciting and I'm, I'm happy about that. So the work is continuing. Um, the Council of Europe, as I'm sure some of you know, passed a, res a resolution and a recommendation endorsing a child's right to physical integrity. Uh, one of our core activists testified to the um, Council of Europe. That was Ron Goldman. Um, there's been activism in, in Denmark and Norway requiring circumcisions to be registered. And, and this is all in the last few years, keep in mind. The CDC in 2014 issued uh, the, the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control in, in the United States. The leading health authority issued proposed guidelines, and they invited one of our core um, activists who's a physician to comment on those. So there's just been all sorts of signs that we're breaking through, that we're really getting heard. The Dutch Medical Association and Germany's Medical Association, and Germany actually cited my organization. Um, they both supported our position, essentially wrote positions that we could have written. 
on there not being a medical need for circumcision and let the child decide. We've had legislation in the U.S. We've had people invited to speak on that. Um, so there's been a lot of progress. Uh, now over here um, in the U.K., there have been a couple very positive cases. In 2015, in a case involving female genital cutting, a U.K. judge described male circumcision as a significant harm. He didn't have to do this. And technically, it's dicta. It's not part of what was needed for the case, but it's still a very positive development. And then two years ago, the UK's High Court of Justice protected two boys from circumcisions that were sought by the father. And there have been some other victories. I'm sure you heard about the case in Germany that circumcision of boys is irreversible bodily injury. And unfortunately, then there was a law passed in political response to that. But the, the court decision is still very important, and there have been a Another one in Germany since then, in 2016, a French man won $38,000 from the surgeon who circumcised him as an adult. So it's amazing. I mean, we're, we're winning. And, and this ragtag team that, that, that my organization put together got invited to come debate this world-renowned epidemiologist. And I frankly didn't feel that confident about it. I'd, I'd never done a PowerPoint in my life, for example. and. Um, this physician co-author of mine said, oh, we know the issue better than they do. Don't worry about it. And I went in there, and it turned out to be true. And, and um, you have to picture this, because on the final day, I was sitting here, and there was a doctor on this side and a doctor on this side of me, because it was four debates. So there were eight total people there, seven physicians and me. And the doctors on each side of me independently said to me, well, we came in totally believing in circumcision, but you've, you've convinced us. And the doctor I was debating the final day said, well, I can't really respond to any of your arguments. So, it's, it's, I mean, when we, and I think this, this ties over to um, the, the men's rights work too, when we really come in and really have strong arguments that are well thought through as our arguments are, and they really aren't answerable by the other side, we're gonna win. And not only are we gonna win, but we are winning. And so I, I've mentioned a few of, There's media work. Uh, Cassie J obviously made a great film where I met my fiance, and and that ended up with um, F Fred. Um, forgetting his last name now. Um, Fred Fred Hayward, who's who's actually going to be our minister at our wedding on Saturday, um, got access to his son after not having access for several years. And there's another movie called The Mask You Live In. Does anybody here know the movie The Mask You Live In? Of course, Karen does. Karen knows everything. A couple other people. Um, I was, I was very surprised. They showed it at my son's middle school and several years ago. And, you know, it's by Jennifer Siebel Newsom, who's Gavin Newsom's wife. Gavin Newsom is the San Francisco mayor who um, most famously legalized gay marriage about eight, nine years ago. So it's not exactly the film that you or I would probably make, but it's pretty good. It's definitely got some feminist tones to it, but it's a pretty good film about what boys face trying to learn to acknowledge their feelings and live in a world that isn't really particularly friendly to that. So even, even these, these media events that are happening, I think, are important. We had a New Hampshire men's commission, which unfortunately folded after a number of years. Um, I mean, Mark Angelucci uh, has done amazing work. He, he filed a complaint against the Selective Service, which is our military draft organization that case has survived several challenges and is is being evaluated by a federal court um, he's won several lawsuits over domestic violence against men and we've had a huge slew of suits over um, either bars or other entities laundromats in some cases dry cleaners that discriminate against males because there's a, a, a civil rights act in California the UNRU Civil Rights Act that forbids that stuff, and it was, I think it was written with the other purpose in mind, but we're using it quite happily to advance men's rights and, and stop the man tax, as it's called. So I, I have to say, too, um, we talk about press other than the movies. There, there's been so much progress lately. I mean, the NCFM, the National Coalition for Men, which is the organization I've been in, longer than I've been involved in this genital autonomy work. NCFM was just in this great article in the New York Times like 10 days ago and very long and really had no trace of this sort of 
hedging and uh, implicit questioning that you often get with these articles. I mean, I think the, the New York Times has not been a good um, forum for our movement, but this was a great article. And it, it couldn't really have come out, I don't think, two, even two years ago. Part of what happened is they came to the NCFM headquarters and Harry Crouch spent three and a half hours with the, with the reporter, but she had to be open to hearing it too. So there's, there's, I mean, I have a list here of all the, all the media that's been happening for the genital autonomy movement and for the gender equity movement. I mean, the LA Times, Newsweek, the LA Daily Journal, um, the BBC had, a, had some very positive stories about genital autonomy work, Penn and Teller's bullshit show. It's, it goes on and on and on. It's, it's really, it's getting to the point where I f really feel like it's not that public opinion is starting to shift we're not quite there yet, but we're getting to the point where sort of a second tipping point where we're at least moving in the direction where that's foreseeable, where there's enough critical mass that I think we're ready for the next phase of the game. And, and that's very exciting. Um, and in Europe, we're, we're seeing different other um, Finnish Medical Association, the Danish Medical Association also uh, questioning circumcision. The Nor Norwegian political parties have been introducing laws. Some of you probably know Iceland has one right now that's being considered. So it's just a, a lot of very exciting developments. L let me talk about HIV just a little bit because people hear about HIV with respect to um, circumcision. I, I'm not going to go into it too much, but it's, it's been very well documented that the three random control, randomized controlled trials in Africa that are now over a decade old just suffer from a truly astounding number of flaws. I, I mean, first of all, the data, even if you take it at face value, doesn't have the numbers to support what they're trying to say it supports. Secondly, the studies were done in Africa on adult populations, so trying to transfer it to the U.S. or elsewhere on child populations makes no sense. And we saw this coming when these studies came out, and, and they said, oh, no, this is just going to be applied to the, the region that the studies were done for in the population and it didn't happen predictably it didn't happen so uh, you know, the, the the trials were terminated just as the data was starting to move in the other direction there were all sorts of ethical violations and, and the other thing is HIV is starting to it's not fashionable to say this but HIV infection has been a worldwide decline for quite a number of years anyway the epidemic is controlling itself in public health measures which is not to, to lose our sight of compassion for any individual person that, that suffers from it, but it's, it's coming under control anyway as a public health measure. And even if that weren't true, there's no reason to import to the US um, treatments that were, were tried in Africa with wildly different um, infection modalities and wildly different public health conditions. In, in Africa, one of the best ways to get HIV is at a public health clinic. So just from that, you can see how different it is, yeah. So the big legal cases have not yet played out as we've hoped with the genital autonomy work. We've had a few cases we brought that seemed promising. We had an equal protection case where we said effectively under the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, that you couldn't discriminate against males and females. And it's true that the female, uh, some, uh, sorry, some of you don't know this, but there's a law that was passed about 20 years ago now in the U.S. that protects against female genital cutting but not male. So that was the basis for the constitutional challenge. And um, it's true that the law protects, is written so as to only protect females, but you're still not allowed to do that. It's not constitutionally sound to write a law that is crafted through its terminology of naming female sexual parts to just protect the females. So we had a challenge against that that didn't work out. We, we had a class action that I was personally involved in as, as a litigator in uh, Queens, New York. Um, Spanish-speaking mothers whose consents were obtained by showing them the second side of a piece of paper that just had their signature space and they were told this is what you have to do to get your baby to go home with you. You have to sign this paper and the first side was the business side of the consent form in English which they didn't speak. Um, Spanish speakers. I, I speak Spanish, so I, do, I did a lot of work with the, with the plaintiffs when we were doing this case. So why haven't we, why haven't we won yet? And this sort of applies to both, um, both issues. There's a number of barriers of, of barriers to acceptance, which we've talked about off and on through this conference. 
differential views of men's and women's discrimination, obviously. Um, still lack of exposure, although we're doing much better with recent media work. And at least in the U.S., courts do not want to endorse issues that haven't been socially approved. The courts follow society. They do not lead society. There was one possible exception to that with the civil rights movement of the 1960s, which has tricked people into thinking that courts actually, and also it's, it's political dogma, frankly, but it, it's, it's deceived people into thinking that, in the U.S. anyway, that the courts can lead society. It doesn't happen. So we have to make social change first and change, change public opinion, and then the courts will follow. And again, I think what's going to happen with both movements is we're going to move the, the, the majority, the people that are in the middle, and we're never, gonna get, we're never gonna get the Orthodox Jews on the circumcision issue. We don't have to. They're gonna become obsolete on this issue. They're, they're gonna get passed by. The world's gonna move on. Next, next issue. And it's just gonna be obvious to everyone that what was the world ever thinking to have such inequality between males and females? What was the world thinking? I think our children, our grandchildren are gonna ask us that. They're not gonna know the answer and that is when we're gonna win. That is going to be the finest day for each of us. Hold back the floodgates is another issue related to resource overload. If males are in, then nobody's out anymore, especially white males. That's the problem. It's not often said explicitly. I think that plays a role. There's a very tempting, I don't think, any, anybody in this room would agree with it, but a very tempting impulse to define things in terms of insiders and outsiders. So if males are victims, if white males are victims, there's no insiders and outsiders anymore. We're all people. We're all people who could be victims, we could be perpetrators, and of course that's how things really are. But to get to that point is, is the work we're doing. I think Elizabeth Hobson referred to it in her talk. It's such an obvious thing. And once we're there, we're going to be there. And we're getting there. And thank you to everybody who's working toward that. One other factor I believe with, with um, general autonomy is conscious or unconscious homophobia, which still plays a role in the US. Certainly, it varies a lot by region. Um, and then the other side of that is we're entering a new world in so many ways, beyond what I've talked about the incredible proliferation of the internet, which brings its positives and negatives. Um, we're, just, we're just focusing on different issues than we used to and, and working on different things. And the, in the US, we're talking about gender a lot, new genders, third genders. I mean, I, w I went to an orientation for my daughter's middle school and they spent 25 minutes talking to us about different genders that our kids can be. and. I find it annoying, frankly, and, and sort of like, I, I'm tolerant of it, and one of my best friends is intersex, so neither male nor female, so I know about this firsthand, and I still find it somewhat of a waste of time, but I think it can be used to our benefit strategically, because it's the rigid notions of male and female that help sustain the whole feminist program and, and all the things we've been talking about. If men could be as sensitive as women, if, if men and women aren't essentially separated, I mean, of course we are different, but if we can break down um, this mental tendency we have to compartmentalize, men are here, women are here, man bad, woman good, I think we can use the, the gender fluidity and these changes to our benefit. I really do. And we don't ha you don't have to agree, to agree with it even to do that. You can be very skeptical about um, some of these things, and you can still use them, use them um, to your advantage. And, and I think it... It truly is a new world and a world of ferment, and it's an exciting world. I'm excited to be here, and it's, um, I feel like up to about 2010, things were going slower than, than I'd hoped, but I feel like since about 2010, we've been putting the pedal to the metal, and things have been going very well, so I'm very excited. So where do we go from here? General autonomy is an exceptional issue characterized by numerous muddles and creating discomfort. Gender equity does much the same. We have a choice as to whether to follow the reigning paradigms or to challenge those paradigms. Both issues are relatively neglected at this point in time, but I think we're doing better on both of those. 
the very resistance such discussions raise can it enable us to move them along and to get to a different point in the discussion. The personal is political for us too, and the impacts can be subtle. In my own life, um, I was unexpectedly divorced about, I didn't get divorced till last year, but I separated about three and a half years ago. And um, there is a subtle role of fear of parental alienation syndrome, which is just there. If I displease my kid's mom, there is always that implied threat. And I'm aware of that. And so the issues we're talking about have a very concrete impact on me. And it's certainly nothing like what some of the speakers who suffered domestic violence or false accusations have had to deal with. But it's still a concrete, quantifiable impact. So what do we do? What do I do? We keep working. And remember to breathe. <laughs> keep working. And remember to rest. And take care of yourself. And look forward to the day when those other folks, the ones that aren't in this room, they're going to become irrelevant. It's going to happen. It might happen while most of us or all of us are still around, in fact. So I'm going to very joyfully use a word that I don't think has been used that often at men's rights conferences and say, midwived by us, the world is going to pass the other side by. And we're going to make the personal political for us. And we're going to win! Yes, hello. My name is uh, Johan Neumann. Uh, I don't have um, a specific question, but I would have three points. Uh, a reflection, uh, an overview, and a definition. Uh, starting with the reflection, if I compare uh, the US to, to Europe, what I see in the US is this uh, cognitive dissonance, because this was done to me, and uh, because it was done to my son. It must be right, it cannot be wrong, therefore it has to continue. We don't have that in Europe. Instead, what we have in Europe uh, is this. Uh, people questioning you. Are you sure that your concern is really genital autonomy uh, and the well-being of children? It smells a lot like Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, because here it is only done to um, Muslims and Jews. So that was the reflection. Then a short overview of the situation in the Nordic countries. You mentioned already uh, a few of them. As you said, Denmark and Iceland, they already have parliament initiatives that will be treated in the parliament. The forecasts for a beneficial outcome are not maybe too positive at this point, though, but we will see. Uh, Finland right now has a problem with a textile company that has initiated a citizen's initiative as part of their own marketing campaign for selling their textiles to women, where it is suggested that the law should be strengthened and sharpened even more regarding female genital mutilation, while leaving boys and men outside of it, widening the gap even more. But also smaller gender-neutral citizens' initiative, initiatives have also been initiated in, in Finland. Uh, this issue is deba debated openly in the media in Denmark, Iceland, and also in Norway. Finally, Sweden. The former Minister for Immigration, Erik Ullenhag, said, If we were to ban circumcision, we would also have to ban the Christian baptism. Thus, he is comparing forcefully remo removing body tissue with putting a little water on the head. And then the Archbishop Antje Jacqueline said, we have to allow religious circumcision in order to allow for every person to be a whole human being. <laughs> and if I still may, my third point, um, uh, it is often said, uh, you use the term circumcision and genital mutilation, and which ones should you use? It's, it's a big, big confusion. And if you allow me, I will present my own uh, definition of the two terms. It's called circumcision. When an adult person has the procedure done to himself, to himself by his own free will, 
In the rare cases where a diagnosed phimosis can, cannot be treated non-surgically, which is most often can. As a euphemism for genital mutilation in cultures and communities where it is considered normal. That was circumcision. Then genital mutilation. It's called genital mutilation when the procedure is done by force, without consent and free will. When mutilating cultures rate the procedure in different levels of severity and justify the procedure that is done in their own culture by distantiating it from the next level, for that is genital mutilation. Well, what we do is only normal circumcision. Thank you. Yeah, I know. The, the, thank you. And, and yeah, that, that was a little a piece I was going to say that I didn't say, but it's very convenient for our movement that female genital cutting exists. It's also very convenient that intersex genital cutting exists. Are people familiar with this? Uh, the numbers vary, but it may be as much as 1% of the population are born intersex, which means neither clearly female nor clearly male, or you can say both male and female. And they're still very common. It's most of the time intersex kids get cut to make them either to make them either into boys or girls I mean so so for b both of those movements have actually had more success in a sense than we have um, and the intersex anti-intersex cutting movement is more recent than our movement and I think we're finding ways to use um, the successes of those movements advantageously in our work um, but th the interesting thing intellectually about it is that Again, it's all people. It, people can be either male, female, or intersex. And it's such a weird thing to say that male genital cutting is OK and female and intersex aren't OK. Even, and they've even shown that the worst forms of male circumcision are worse than the, than the least harmful forms of female genital cutting. So the thing just collapses. And I just don't think it's sustainable. It's not intellectually sustainable. So many people are writing papers now. There's been a flurry of academic papers the last two or three years. And when I started writing papers, um, like in 1996, there were like five people writing papers about circumcision. Now there's people every week or every month, not every week, but every month there's probably two authors I haven't heard of before writing a new paper. And a lot of them are really, really good. They're almost all in favor of genital autonomy, so in favor of our position. Um, as far as the religion thing goes, it's a tricky issue. You have to tread with a little bit of care, especially in these days. And the other thing is, Jewish kids and Muslim kids, which itself is a misnomer because when you're born, you're not any religion. And the UN documents say that. The Charter of Human Rights and other protections, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, say that that's true. Your parent can't force the religion on the child. So why is it OK to physically mark the child, to brand them, to tattoo them? With their, um, with their parents' religion. It, it obviously isn't, and we just need to raise consciousness, just like a lot of other issues that we didn't realize. And I mean, there's obvious ones from our, our past, you know, a, a, a black person being three-fifths of a white, a slave being three-fifths of a white person. I, that's taken a little out of context, but that's just one of many examples. Um, we're, we're gradually progressing as a civilization, and it's not a one-step up thing. We sometimes step back, but it, gradually we're figuring it out. But how does this exist? How, does, how can this even be, be tolerated? So I, I think you talk about these issues, and it's the rights of everyone. And everyone has the right to choose their own religion. And I think the Jews and the Muslims will have to work things out in their own communities. But again, and I recognize there's a lot, a lot of Islamic people in this world. It's a huge number. And still, we get to the point where we've moved on from that culturally, which is pretty much where the UK is already. But when the US gets to that point, the game's going to move on. And there may be religious circumcisions going on for another 50 years after the non-religious circumcisions stop. But sooner or later, it's going to be stopped. And then as far as cognitive dissonance goes, you're completely right. That's completely what's happening, that, that people can't hold these two conflicting ideas in their mind. And so they get so frantic subconsciously that, oh my goodness, I couldn't have hurt my child. There's no way. So they find a reason why circumcision is OK. I mean, look at the re ideas. I mean, this idea that like your son should look like your father, for example, so absurd. I mean, I gave my son a bath every week and my daughter, too, until they were five. He never once looked at my penis and said, why does that look different from mine? And it, it's just so silly. There's this great cartoon of this, of this father standing there with, like, he's lost one arm and he's lost one leg. 
and um, they say, oh, we wanted the son to look exactly like the dad, and that's why we had the circumcision. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, there is one political party. I don't want to say which one it is, because um, a number of people here may be favorable towards it, maybe even members of it, so I'm not going to say. But the issue of male genital mutilation was raised, and the official response was not to go there because it might take away some of the um, some of the opposition to female genital mutilation because male genital mutilation is so much more acceptable generally. What do you feel about that argument? Here's here's what I think about that argument. I'm tired and I'm fed up. We we live fewer years. We commit suicide more. We, we have numerous or organizations in the government, and I believe this is true in the UK as well, for women's health, none for men's health. We had a list of 21 issues up here the other day, about every one of which is true. I mean, as I said, I have to live in fear of parental alienation syndrome every day of my life. Um, I'm just basically lucky I didn't have a crazy uh, mother of my kids or I'd be at their, at their mercy, her mercy completely. I'm just tired of it. I mean, when are we going to stand up for justice? And I'm not saying anybody in this room, but when as a culture, when as a world, are we going to stand up for justice? We've solved all these problems. We've been to the moon. We've, 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 we've got such a better world than we used to have. And you're, you're, you're seriously, you're going to tell me that it's okay to cut males because it's politically inconvenient? Yeah, justice is politically inconvenient. Well, that's what we're all about. I mean, I can't accept that. I cannot accept that. And I will never accept that to my dying day. Hi. Um, you seem to be really comfortable um, suggesting that we use what is essentially the promotion of gender identity confusion in children and uh, gender fluidity. You seem to be really comfortable suggesting that we use that to our advantage. Do, how many people do you think in this room are worried about how that looks and how normal that well, might seem? L let me... Let me sharpen that. I'm not talking about anything about children. I'm saying there's a lot of gender fluidity in the world. Definitions of men and women are freeing up, as, as we saw yesterday w with Eric. I mean, males, even in sport, are not identifying themselves fully at one end of masculinity. They're putting themselves at a three on a scale of one to six. It's a new world, folks. Being a male today is a tw in your 20s, it's not the same thing as, as some old geezer like I am. It's just, it's just a different ball game. And so, these, these identities are freeing up. It's, it's an exciting world. We can be what we want to be. We can still be what we are. Nobody's going to stop me from being me, but, but there's also more freedom and more interplay and more fluidity. And so let's use that to our advantage. Let's say, great, there's more fluidity. So you know what? You're trying to make these definitions about what men are and what women are, and you're trying to give women more rights because of it. It doesn't apply anymore if it ever did, which it didn't. That's what I'm saying. I'm not talking about kids. That, that's, that's a rat hole. You don't want to go down that road. Yeah. How so? What's the difference between manip manipulative and opportunistic? It's opportunistic. It's, it's what we all do. Every day we get up and we think about what, what issues, how should we work. Look, if you, if you folks don't think it's going to work, fine. Don't do it. But what, is that, what does that word even mean? I mean, everything we do is to advance toward our goal. It could be effective or not effective. OK. I'm sorry? Um, Stephen, Svoboda, Stephen Svoboda, thank you very much. Very good, very good.